Hello, it's uh, May the 8th, 2021. Uh, today, I have decided I'm going to talk about Depeche Mode and their first album, Speak and Spell. Um, there is no particular reason why I've chosen Depeche Mode or this album. Um, I could say somewhat cynically that I've tied it to fit in with Dave Garn's 59th birthday, which is today. Uh, but the answer is no. I only found that out whilst Googling earlier on in the week that that was his birthday. Um, and uh, I'm also um, aware that what I don't want to do is constantly hit you with the same videos about the same bands all the time and go, here's yet another one about, you know, and I've got like loads of bands that I'm talking about at the moment. Um, but you could go, well, it's either going to be The Cure or Pet Shop Boys or U2 or New Order or Suede or, you know, I'm going to mix it up a bit. Still have an old band, though, a band that formed 40 years ago, Depeche Mode. Um, but, you know, as, as these progress over time, I will get to more bands and more recent bands as well, by the way. Um, and of course, one of the big signs of being old and out of touch is to say, oh, good music's out there. You just have to find it. So I'm definitely never, ever going to say that. Actually, that's a complete lie. Of course, I'm going to say it at some point. Um, I'm fast approaching, or in fact, I'm deep in the midst of my late 40s. To pretend that I am young and hip and how do you do, fellow kids, is a complete fib, of course. Um, I am not. Um, now, one of the other things I'm also going to talk about, and by the way, um, I have had a request to talk about the wedding present. Um, that's quite a task. There's an awful lot of records to talk about. When it comes to the wedding presents, uh, rest assured I will be doing those at some point in the future. Um, I listened to Tommy three times yesterday for my sins as part of research. Unsurprisingly, the first wedding present one I'm going to do is probably going to be about that album. So we need to go back in time um, to talk about Depeche Mode. There are other Depeche Mode videos on the internet uh, and I am not going, I've deliberately not watched any of those uh, because I don't want to be influenced or not, as the case might be, about them. Um, talking about the first Depeche Mode album, Speak and Spell. So I need to give you a couple of factoids. Factoids, is that a word? Yeah, factoids uh, about this album. In the 1987 Depeche Mode fan club magazine, they did a poll of what the best and worst Depeche Mode LP was. Uh, Speak and Spell came in at the fifth best Depeche Mode LP. It also came in as the worst um, and the uh, when the band were asked what their least favourite songs were, uh, three members of the band uh, chose No Disco off this album. And when asked in 2006, uh, both Fletch and Martin said that their least favourite song, uh, all the Depeche Mode songs ever, was What's Your Name? Uh, and I'd like to say that I agree with both Fletch and Martin, and I think Alan also said that he didn't like No Disco. Um, in saying that both those songs, No Disco and What's Your Name, that are on this album, are terrible. Um, but I will talk about those a little bit later, because first we have to do a little bit of uh, going back in time and, and a, a little bit of uh, uh, talking about what happened first. So the first Depeche Mode single is Dreaming of Me. It was released as a 7-inch in a picture sleeve, a 7-inch without a picture sleeve, and not, despite what Discogs might tell you, as a 12-inch. There was no 12-inch version of this that was released until probably about 2018, uh, when Depeche Mode did 12-inch singles box sets, and they did a 12-inch edition of Dreaming of Me. Um, and Dreaming of Me, as, as a track, I think comes in two different mixes, by the way, even though they're the same recording. One has a fade out and one has what's called cold end. Um, so the band play the song until it finishes and they've already worked out how the song is going to end. I think fade outs on songs are generally very lazy indeed because you have to work out how the songs are going to end when you play them live anyway. So you might as well work that out whilst you're writing the song uh, and then you have an end on the record. The other thing is when you're writing a song, um, do you just go, oh, I've just, I just repeat this bit and I haven't worked out how to make it end or do you actually work out an end or you just go fuck it i'm giving up and just stop playing halfway through the outro and go ah we'll just fade it it'll be fine i don't know um all the songs i've written have had cold hard endings uh, because i think a, a climax is important um, and as we all know it's not over until it's over uh, as, as prince puts in his live album uh which is in the what, one night alone box set in 2002 
So to start with Depeche Mode, uh, you really have to take a, a little bit of a step back to when the band had another name. Uh, they first played shows under the name of Composition of Sound and Dave Garn wasn't a member. I think Vince Clark was singing the vocals alongside Martin Gore and they were effectively a three piece. And before that, um, before they got synthesizers, um, they were actually using conventional instruments. So I think Fletch played bass, for example. Um, and uh, Vince wrote all his songs on guitar. He writes all of his songs in major keys, which means they're happy. And I don't quite know how else to describe that. I, I know nothing about music theory. I am told that the minor keys are the black ones on the keyboard and the major keys are the white ones. And uh, Vince wrote all his songs on uh, the white keys. And um, when I played Just Can't Get Enough uh, on keyboards, it's all white keys, I think. Uh, although it has been about 20 years since I've played it on a keyboard. And alongside just can't get enough and a forest they're the only two songs i can play on keyboard which makes me probably very well qualified to be either fletch or lol tolhurst uh, in 1985 um because i don't think either of them are, are perhaps the best keyboardists in the world uh, i'm just jealous really i'll be honest i wanted those jobs and i figured i couldn't do it any worse than they were doing it at the time um so composition of sounds started playing shows i think in early 1980 uh, and i think maybe they played five or six shows uh, before they noticed a, a chap called dave garn um, who uh, they thought might be a good vocalist and i think his audition piece was to sing david bowie's heroes and when they heard him sing it they went okay you're a good singer and so Dave Gunn went to the last show before he joined the band where he operated the light desk. And then I think I think it's 14th of June, 1980, he played his first show as a, as a member of Depeche Mode and as their vocalist. And I think it's around about that time that the band changed their name as well to Depeche Mode. And Depeche Mode, by the way, is a, uh, if you're French, you already know this, so you can skip about the next 30 seconds, is uh, based upon the name of a magazine called Fast Fashion, which in French is Depeche Mode and uh, was published in France and as far as I can work out um, there has never been a discussion between the magazine and the band about the name um, it's kind of weird actually to think some of the records that the band have made um, have the name uh, uh, when translated for the French uh, is fast fashion I can't think of some of those songs having anything to do with anything fast or with anything particularly fashionable actually uh, but so be it um, the band had a, a lot of songs when they started off. As I said, Vince was writing all of his songs on guitar. He was writing them all in major keys. Uh, and effectively, I, I kind of think of Depeche Mode as basically an electronic punk band. Uh, so if you listen to the songs that they were writing, songs like New Life, Dreaming of Me, Just Can't Get Enough, Photographic, you could easily imagine them transposed to being played by a fast drummer and a dirty guitarist and a vocalist kind of yelling out the words as, as kind of like a, a kind of like Basils and Rock version of Sham 69 or something, but without all the dodgy bits. Um, um, and the the band, uh, you listen to the songwriting as well that there was in the first album, sounds a lot to me like the Ramones, short, sharp, punchy, the riffs are very kind of like, they're almost mo uh, monotone in so much as there is just one note or one lead note at any particular time, there isn't a chord or anything like that that's going on, there's no extended notes around there, it's all just very much like very sharp, short notes, very quick choruses, uh, very minimal songwriting structure. Uh, so really, Depeche Mode are a punk band with synthesizers, and at least they were for a couple of years after uh, the release of Speak and Spell, in my opinion, before they then started to evolve. Uh, you could easily have imagined uh, a comedy punk band doing a cover version of something like Puppets or uh, What's Your Name? Although, of course, What's Your Name is an absolutely terrible song. Um, there were a lot of songs that the band played live that they never recorded in the early years, uh, recorded Recordings don't exist of, of many of them. Uh, so there's a, a song called Secrets and Sunday Morning, which they played on the 1982. Tour. Both of those are, uh, have no existing recordings that anyone knows about. Um, there's a track called Moldy on Doe, which was a cover version of a band called Lieutenant Pigeon, whoever the hell they are. I'm going to have to listen to that, then try and imagine Depeche playing it and go, oh my God, that's awful. Uh, there's one called Mirror is Standing, uh, which no recordings of that. Uh, exist anymore and there's also and um, they did a cover version of Mamma Mia uh, an instrumental version of the ABBA track uh, with the backing from photographic but the melody from uh, Mamma Mia played instead of the vocals again no recordings of that exist and in some respects my brain tells me that that's probably a very good thing and quite a narrow and lucky escape um, 
of the other songs that exist. There's one called Addiction, which is also known as Closer All the Time. Uh, there's a track called Radio News, which is circulating in a demo format. Um, there was a song called Television Set, which was written by one of the band's friends called Jason Knott, which was played between 1980 and 1982. Uh, it's a track called Reason Man, which they played live but was never recorded. Um, they also did a cover version of the Ever Everly Brothers' The Price of Love. Uh, and I think, was it Jerry Marsden and the Pacemakers? I like it as well. They played as, as late as 1982. And of course, you go, well, I'd love to hear those, uh, and you can, uh, although you can't necessarily easily get a hold of them. Um, the first available and circulating Depeche Mode live bootleg recording uh, is taken, I think, from the, uh, I think it's um, the Bridge House on the 30th of October 1980. And uh, the second one was recorded at the South End Technical College, which was, I think, on the 14th of November 1990. It's on this uh, bootleg CD from 1990 called A Nice Surprise, uh, which features a, a song from the Violator Tour recorded in Paris. And then following it up uh, with the set from 1980 in South End, which features television set Addiction, which is also known as the, uh, the Ghost of Modern Time or Closer All the Time. Um, and uh, it also features uh, Dreaming of Me, Just Can't Get Enough, Big Muff, I Sometimes Wish I Was Dead, Tora Tora Tora, Photographic, New Life and Ice Machine. So you've got, you know, like a, a nine song set, uh, which has a couple of unreleased songs on it. Um, luckily, uh, good quality recordings of uh, many of these songs exist, um, either in radio broadcasts from live shows or a radio session or a demo tape. The first one is a demo tape. Um, which started circulating probably about five years ago, features a track called Radio News, uh, also features demos of Ice Machine and Photographic. I will post links to them down there, so you can hear early embryonic 18-year-old Depeche Mode whittling about with synthesizers uh, and some songs that you may not know or may not have heard. Um, and then also television set and I think The Price of Love and I Like It were also broadcast on radio when band shows were broadcast on FM radio or TV. Uh, so we've got good quality mixing desk recordings of perhaps unamazing songs. Um, and they're worth listening to. Uh, now Depeche's notoriously tight quality control has meant that those songs haven't been officially released. And the official line coming out from the band is that there is very little in the way of unreleased uh, studio material that's really worth investigating. Uh, I think that's a fib, to be honest. Hopefully it doesn't sound too hard for me to say that. I think just think the band have a very tight quality control. They did a BBC session in the middle of 1981 where they did four songs, um, and many, many times, Strange Fruit Records in the 80s, and later Wind Song in the 90s, uh, tried to get the band's permission to release those, and the band always declined uh, those that radio session even though it's four songs off the album. So you have to rely on bootleg recordings. And again, if I can find it on YouTube, I'll post a link to it in the comments section down there so you can listen to this early embryonic Depeche Mode when they're all about 18 uh, and uh, they're all kind of you know using their spare money from their day jobs um, to record. So the first single um, was released in, I think, February 1981. And it is called uh, Dreaming of Me. Here is the seven inch copy of it. Like a lot of my records, I bought this in about 1989, 1990, um, when I was on a tight budget uh, by scouring the secondhand record shops in the UK, or more correctly, in Birmingham. I didn't even go as far as Wolverhampton uh, for the first year because it was half an hour on the train. And that was too far out of the way. And by the way, my brother says that when I put my head behind here and I go, quiet, I'm yawning. That wasn't a yawn, OK? I just decided to do that for a bit because I thought it might break up the image a little bit. Oh, look, I, the man who mistook his record collection for a life. Um, but now, Dreaming of Me, first single, um, it's an auspicious start. Um, you wouldn't have thought in 1981 when this came out that if you were going to put your money on a band being absolutely huge in conquering american stadiums you wouldn't have said it's going to be depeche mode you probably and you would have been probably far safer to say that it would have been uh, orchestral maneuvers in the dark uh, and you would have also been on the basis of the track record that the band had uh, as, as in their previous incarnation if you had said new order 
you'd have probably been on to, uh, you'd have probably been a safer bet to say that this 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 band who self describe themselves as three Walters um, would not necessarily have gone on to be a stadium filling band across the world. Um, I must admit, I'm not a huge fan of Speak and Spell. I think it's their worst LP, and I think it's their worst LP. Um, although it has some competition in Exciter. I think it's their worst LP for or a number of reasons. I think the songwriting is quite immature. Uh, the structures of the songs are quite simplistic. They're almost nursery rhymes. As I've said, they're written in major keys. The melody lines are very short. They don't have that kind of revisible. They don't have, um, they don't reward repeated listening. Everything is there on the surface. The first time that you hear a song like New Life or Just Can't Get Enough, it's all there. And nothing else to listen to. It's all there in the first listen. You get it straight away. It's like an action movie. Um, and as I've said, they're kind of like an electronic punk band at this point. The songs that they're writing don't have a huge amount of depth. Um, and Vince Clark himself said, uh, and I will quote from this book here, uh, which I, I reread a little portion of earlier. He said, um, Martin said, I never understood what Vince was writing about. Often the grammar was a mystery to me, let alone the meaning. To which Vincent said, there was no meanings in the song at all. Nothing. They were very stupid lyrics, you know. Uh, and that's absolutely right. And that's another reason why I'm not a huge fan of, of Speak and Spell. The words are gibberish. Um, but I think I will... I mean, actually, if you go for the words to uh, Dreaming of Me, uh, which I've got up on the screen here, um, and we'll just we'll just quickly visit what those, those lyrics might, might be, because uh, they're not very good at all. So, um, Dreaming of Me... Uh, has the lyric, light switch, man switch, film was broken, only then, all the night, fused tomorrow, dancing with a distant friend. Um, filming and screening, I picture the scene, filming and screening, dreaming of me. So we left, understanding, clean cut, so we're sounding fast. Talked of sad, I talked of war, I laughed and climbed the rising cast. Quickly I remembered, fused and saw a face before, timing, reason, understanding like association hall look i've got to be honest those words are gibberish they don't mean anything uh, for all for all that i care they could be in hopelandic or um, simlish or uh, any other language that i don't understand it's kind of like at the end of star trek 4 when uh, they're talking about possibly communicating to the great big probe that's going to wipe out mankind and they go well what do we say to it so well, we you know we can we can copy the sounds but we'd end up it would sound like you're just coming out with gibberish and you'd be going mm -mm, yeah boo, boo, blah, boo, boo. Or, or like you know if you if you backwards if you take a speech file and you play it backwards it sounds like someone is talking but it doesn't sound like them actually talking um you know if you watch twin peaks for example um and they've all the scenes where the walk backwards and you go well that you know that's that's english i guess it kind of makes sense but you could take the lyrics from dreaming of me and you could do them backwards in a twin twin peaks voice and you go know, it still doesn't mean anymore let's switch man switch Film was broken only then, all the night, used tomorrow, dancing with a distant friend. And it's like, it doesn't mean any more or any less. They're just nonsense bullshit words. And, and as you've probably worked out, not only do I talk like I'm paid by the words, words are really important to me. And language is really important. And being able to communicate ideas and concepts and imagery um, i've always seen that as one of the key things about art and art being the ability for human beings to communicate ideas concepts feelings from one human being to another you know that's what we, i think art is there for and so therefore some of the lyrics on these songs are not art they're nonsense you might as well be listening to deaf leopards and deaf leopards choose their words by the way of what they sound as opposed to what they mean some of those songs don't have any meaning whatsoever something like hysteria for example the whole of that album has no meaning lyrically uh, in any really tangible, meaningful way. The words and the, the songs are created, and then there's a section where the words have to fit in. And it's like, well, you've got 16 seconds, and you've got 
74 syllables. So what are you going to do? And you go, uh, love is like a bomb and I couldn't get it on. Living like a lover with a red afon. Sometime, anytime, sugar me sweet. Come on, baby, sugar me. Hey, yeah. And, you know, that's like pour some sugar on me, which is a great song. It sounds fantastic. The words, bullshit. They don't mean anything. You might as well be reading a shopping list. Um, or, for example, the lyrics to So What by The Cure, which are actually a shopping list. And if you pay now, then you can get, I don't know, some cake and decorating icing set for £1.39 by the 31st of December. 1979 with a stamped address envelope terms and conditions apply the words are rubbish to some of the early Depeche Mode songs and that's why I don't like the album as much as I could do and some of the songs are very very simplistic and very straightforward Dreaming of Me is not a great song B-side is Ice Machine that bloody brilliant absolutely great should have been on the album Ice Machine. I don't understand why it's not on the album at all. Ice Machine is one of the best B-sides I've ever heard by anybody, ever. Um, of course, the B-side of your first single is normally going to be something that's pretty damn good, but the Ice Machine is, was a song that they've played live right up until the end of the 1985 tour. It survived when the A-side was long, long gone, and uh, Ice Machine is a fantastic Depeche Mode track. If you don't know it, listen to it um, the other thing i should point out by the way is when they did the recording of this uh, on, they didn't have sequences necessarily they were all working on you know borrowed bits of equipment and they were all doing it in late night studio sessions uh built around you know their working patterns because fletch and martin worked in london at the time uh vince wrote the songs on a full-time basis and i think dave was was falling out of art college so those songs when you hear them being on the record it's not like someone set up a sequencer to play that same part 42 times some guy has played that part 42 times and somehow has got rsi off doing it and that's something actually which carried its way all the way through all of the depeche albums so even up to now um, when you hear something being played uh, sometimes it's just some guy just going dun 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 you know and that's what they're doing they're playing on the on the keyboards um well, maybe not when they play it live, because uh, of course it's all on tape, but no one will find out um, as as the lyric goes into uh, <laughs> a Pet Shop Boys song. Um, the second single, uh, and this is a, a considerable step up in terms of ability, is uh, New Life. And again, uh, it was issued 7 inch, seven inch in a picture sleeve and a 12 inch. Uh, and this was where, where Depeche did their first remixes as well so new life is is a much better song it's still not brilliant but it's much better and the b-side is called shout shout is incredibly good uh, and it should have been on the album instead of uh, what's your name no disco or boys say go shout is one of the best b-sides again it is a an album track that somehow has managed to sneak its way in a balaclava to be a b-side um new life is is much better again there is a slight difference in the mixes uh, between the various versions of the track um but uh, perhaps this is more evident on the first 12 inch single that Tepesh mode released which is new life uh, this is an original from uh 1981 as you can probably see it has the hmv shop price tag on it there a whole one pound 99 and it was the 30 second record in the collection of the person that I brought, bought it from. Um, now the 12 inch, it, it belonged to Phil L by the way. Oh, I'd forgotten that. Phil L had written his name on there. If I had Tipex, I probably would have Tipex that over, uh, but I haven't used Tipex for at least 10 years. And New Life has a remix, which is exactly four minutes, which has a, a longer ending to it. And the B side of it is a, uh, a track called the Rio Mix of Shout, which is an extended bouncy 12 inch version of the track um and and as i've said before shout is a great b-side however i will also say this is not the most original cover because this in a slightly different form of also appears on the cover of a black sabbath album the name of which i somewhat forget because i can but the illustration according to the back sleeve is by simon rice uh, and uh there you have it. So um, New Life is, is a pretty good song. But again, it screams early single before you really manage to work out how to write songs. 
Um, and, and one of the, the risks that there is, I think, of being in a band, especially in the early years, is you've got no life experience and you've got no technical skills. So you've only just started writing songs. And sometimes you're not very good at writing songs. So actually, a lot of people go, oh, some band's first album is the best and some band's first album is the worst. Uh, and that's why Speak and Spell holds the unusual position of being both the fifth best and the first worst uh, Depeche Mode album. Um, the singles had reissues on CD, uh, and these these three CD singles uh, came out in 1991. They were on a, a box set, which was called um, One to Six, uh, which is here. Uh, it was also released as independent CD singles in France in the late 80s. Uh, that's Dreaming of Me with the seven-inch cover and Ice Machine on the B-side. Here is New Life um, with the 12-inch cover on there. And also shout and the Rio mix of shout and I think the uh, yeah the the inside sleeve contained a photograph of the, the seven inch sleeve design there of New Life. Again, not quite sure why a human being is climbing out of an egg, uh, but as Vince himself said, the songs had no meaning whatsoever. There was also a third single. You will know this song. It is just can't get enough. This is the CD single that contains both the seven inch and twelve inch A and B sides, um, but. That's jumping ahead slightly. So the next Depeche Mode release, after those first two singles, after uh, Dreaming of Me and New Life, was another seven-inch single, actually, um, which was attached free to the cover of a magazine called Flexi Pop. And here it is. Uh, this is um, not the, the repressing of the Flexi Disc, uh, but this is an original 1981 Flexi Disc. Uh, threw me the first time I played it because the, the record is actually on the B side here and the writing is on the A side there. So what you end up having is, I, I, I hadn't thought about that, I just put this on and thought, okay, that'll be fine. Oh, I wonder why it's not playing a song. And the answer why it wasn't playing a song is, all the songs were on the B side. Well, anyway, and that was so that the flexes is the B side didn't get damaged in transit, by the way. Um, and, and people didn't return it going, this flexi disc does not play, it is broken, it is pining for the fjords. Um, and so that 7-inch contains uh, an exclusive recording of uh, I Sometimes, or Sometimes I Wish I Was Dead, uh, which as Fletch and Martin were on holiday, uh, was a recording by Vince Clark playing all the instruments and um, Dave Garn doing the vocal, um, which is a completely different recording to the version that's released on the Speak and Spell album. Um, and it's it's a very good track. It's not perhaps the best track ever, um, but it's an interesting alternate mix and it's not been. It wasn't on it wasn't on the reissue of Speak and Spell. So there was also another track which was released on a compilation album called Some Bizarre. Uh, and I don't have the Some Bizarre compilation album uh, because I am lazy, uh, to be honest. Um, but it was later added as a CD bonus track to the 1998 edition of the singles 81 to 85. That track is called Photographic. It's an alternate studio recording of Photographic. Um, and it's available in digital CD form uh, on, on this singles album here. Um, it's pretty good. Um, Photographic is a classic, by the way. I've only played it many, many times live uh, and played it live as late as 2010. Um, so I, I, I saw them play it, I think, 2010 and I think 2006 as well, um, which means I've only seen two tra tracks from uh, Speak and Spell played live. Now, the thing with Speak and Spell, um, which is the next thing I'm going to be talking about, and I probably should, should bring it up to your attention because um, otherwise I'm going to break the chronology of this. The thing with Speak and Spell is... It's not a great record. Um, I know I've been talking about it for 28 minutes and 5 seconds at this point. Um, but it is not a great record at all. It's um, not the first batch of songs that the, the band wrote, but the second batch of songs that the band wrote. Most bands, when they're writing songs, the first six or seven songs don't come out on an album. They tend to leave those, stick them on B-sides, and then maybe the songs that are on the album, they end up being like the 15th, 16th, 20th song. Or if you're Guns N' Roses, they're the 120th song that you've written. Uh, and, and Speak and Spell was released in November 1981, not October, uh, with advance orders of 80,000 copies. Um, so the band were able to, to really give up their day jobs. 
and start as a proper band in, in earnest. Um, and it was preceded by a single, um, the first Depeche Mode single to chart, the first Depeche Mode single with a video, and the first Depeche Mode uh, single that they still play live, which is Just Can't Get Enough. Here's the 7-inch the of it backed with um, a, a remix or a, a, an instrumental version of a track called Any Second Now. And to me, Any Second Now sounds weird when Martin sings it. It should always be this version here, which is the instrumental. And uh, I have the sad memories of, of listening, of going to nightclubs in 1989, 1990. Uh, sometimes the, the more popular mainstream nightclubs and they'd play this early in the night uh, and the DJ would always fade it out just after he sang just can't get enough and shout sex uh, because that's the kind of thing that nightclub DJs would do they went full Alan Partridge indeed uh, which is a shocking state of affairs um, it was pretty much only a matter of time before one of them shouted Jurassic Park and played Joe Bunny or something um, yeah so just can't get enough there's a 7 inch again bought uh, when I was very much younger and here's a 12 inch of Just Can't Get Enough. I'm guessing this is the 33rd 12 inch in Phil L's collection. Uh, and I'm also guessing that he's written his name on the label. So let, let's find out. And let's see what happens. So this is an original inner sleeve uh, from the early 80s. You can tell by the fact that it's ripped and torn. Um, no, has Phil written his name on that? Yes, he has. Brilliant. I should get my tip out. Uh, and that features the Shizo mix. I just can't get enough, which is a long extended 12 inch version. Uh, the band often played the Shizo mix live. And uh, apparently, an extended version of Any Second Now instrumental. Um, it also has uh, a different sleeve. Um, I'm not quite sure what the, the purpose of that sleeve is or what it's meant to signify. I don't think it's meant to signify anything, actually. And the, uh, the, on the B side, you've got a tiny reproduction of the cover of the 7-inch there, which is a picture of a cat lying very, very contentedly on a, a rug. Uh, again, this is an original copy because the HMV price sticker puts it at the extortionate cost of £1.99. Uh, and I, 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 I don't even think you could buy anything in HMV for £1.99 anymore, uh, let alone a 12-inch single. These days, people will pay out 12 inch singles at probably 13 quid or something equally extortionate. 33rd record in Phil L's collection, uh, but not in Phil L's collection anymore. Now, the thing is, people used to write their names on the sleeves or on the on the on the label, so people wouldn't steal these records when they went and played them at parties. Um, I don't even know what parties are. Certainly, haven't been to one for a very very long time indeed. Uh, and as I've said before, just can't get enough went into the charts. I was followed up with this single, Speak and Spell, uh, and the cover is exactly what you think it is. It is a swan covered in a plastic bag. It's an awful cover. The uh, 19, where is it now? I've put a copy somewhere. There's a 1988 uh, CD edition of it, which features bonus tracks that has that as the cover. That is so much better than this. Um, and for some reason, the band paid a thousand pounds for this cover. It's awful. The guy that did it should have paid them a thousand pounds. It's dreadful. It's a swan in a plastic bag sitting on what looks like a bunch of twigs. I can't tell actually if that's a black metal band logo or a bunch of twigs. I'm not sure. If it's a black metal band logo, it's really, really good. Um, but if it isn't, then it's just another pile of twigs. So this is a, a budget price version of Speak and Spell um, from the UK. Uh, with a barcode, so that's probably about late 80s or thereabouts. It's still in its shrink wrap, uh, although obviously I've broken the shrink wrap in order to play the audio goodies inside, and I was not pleased listening to this. I should point out, by the way, that if, if this was the only record the band had made, I wouldn't own it. I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't own uh, Just Can't Get Enough. I wouldn't own any of these records if this was the only rap album the band had played. Because if I just gone and listened to this i'd have been like this isn't very good you know, i'd own it now and i'd own it now by virtue of the fact that i really like vince clark's work in erasure and yazoo i think he's a genius uh, and i would have well i want to listen to the early stuff he did beforehand so i would have got the assembly and i would have got this but i wouldn't have loved it i wouldn't have listened to it loads i would have gone well, whatever happened to those guys and then you know 
Depeche would have had a, a certain career playing a half hour set at a Sounds of the 80s mid afternoon show at Butlins or something. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm playing Speak and Spell in four uh, with associated B sides, something like that. And I inevitably would have seen them at some point. Uh, but I would have been like, oh my God, man, what's happened? They've all gone bald. I know I'm a fat one to talk when it comes to criticising people about hairstyles, but there you are. Um, so Speak and Spell is the worst Depeche Mode LP. The second worst Depeche Mode LP is Exciter, which is also tragically misnamed and should have been called Bora, but it isn't. Um, so this one, Speak and Spell, has some really terrible tracks on it. Um, so the, the track list is New Life, which we've already got. Slightly different alternate mix on the LP. Uh, the full band recording version of I Sometimes Wish I Was Dead, which is not the version that's on the flexi disc. Uh, then there's Puppets. Then there's the three worst Depeche Mode songs that have ever been recorded. Uh, Boys Say Go, No Disco, and What's Your Name. Now, if I was making the LP, those songs, B-sides. And uh, on the instead of those, I put Ice Machine, Shout, and Dreaming of Me on the LP. Um, but since I'm not in charge, if you buy Speak and Spell, you have to listen to Boys Say Go, which is awful. Uh, no Disco, which is still regarded by Fletch and Martin as the worst Depeche Mode song of all time. Um, uh, and What's Your Name, which actually uh, replaced No Disco in 2006. What's Your Name is garbage. I would be much happier if that song had never been released. Um, because the chorus goes, hey, you're such a pretty boy. You're, hey, you're such a pretty boy. Hey, you're such a pretty boy. You're so pretty. And I'm like, oh my God, really? That's what you're doing? The words are awful. They make the rest of the song worse. It would be better as an instrumental. Um, What's Your Name is a pile of shit. And uh, I hate that song. It is the worst Depeche Mode song. No, Disco is the second worst Depeche Mode song. Yes, Pimp is better than No Disco. And Boys Say Go is the third worst Depeche Mode song, which means that, yes, Zen Station, the B-side of, uh, I think, Free Love, um, is better still than that. Side two, All Killer No Filler, though. Photographic gets a re-recorded version. Uh, Tora, 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 Martin's first big co-write, uh, his first first song based on the, um, the, the Pearl Harbor bombings of 1941 uh, is on there. We've got Big Muff, which is an instrumental named after a guitar me pedal. Uh, then we've got a vocal version of Any Second Now that Martin sings on. And then we've got Just Can't Get Enough. And the credits to this just go as far as saying Synthetics and Voices by Depeche Mode, um, which is um, a very Kraftworkian thing to say. They're just, you know, music art, data mix, craft work. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's my least favourite Depeche Mode album. If it was the only album they ever made, I would own it. It's made better in retrospect by the fact that you can see where the rest of the band have come from over time. But it is a bag of shit. Um, well, certainly three songs of it are, uh, which are only vastly improved by the CD edition that came out in 1988, which has got Dreaming of Me, Ice Machine, Shout, any second now, and the 12 inch mix of Just Can't Get Enough, and it's got a better cover as well. Um, so, if you're going to buy a version of Speak and Spell, buy this one and then just skip tracks four to six and then just keep playing, really. Um, there was uh, in 2006, I think, as I've mentioned before, the band did a, a major bit of retrospective activity uh, and they released C super audio CDs and DVD editions of their albums with 5.1 mixes on this is one of those um these are the definitive versions of the albums to get by the way if you if you've got the opportunity to get them the cd and dvd reissues of all the albums are the business see i'm not even going to cover my mouth when i do it just going to yawn in front of you because it's a saturday and i'm trying to cut down on my caffeine intake and it's quite late at night i'm not bored i'm tired there's a difference um, and this is the uh, the CD one has a 12 track version of the album which is the album as it is uh, with Dreaming of Me as the last track then the DVD has a half hour documentary called Do We Really Have to Give Up Our Day Jobs uh, then it's got the 12 tracks from the LP in 5.1 mixes 
and it's also got let me have a look 5.1 mixes of uh, the ice machine shout any second now and the remix of just can't get enough now those 5.1 mixes were recompiled over the preset period of 12 months roughly a month per album and around about mid 2005 to mid 2006 uh, the band's studio engineers went back and recreated the songs using the original master tapes and where the original master tapes couldn't be found occasionally they used uh, live backups of them so the mixes and the performances are ever so slightly different on some of the songs on the 5.1 mixes uh, but not in any way so that you would notice the intention is to recreate the original experience and feel so you're not getting an alternate mix of the album you're getting a 5.1 mix of the album that sounds almost you know 99.9 percent .9 identical to the same thing and uh, it's got the five extra tracks on there's five point ones as well the promo videos for this album are on the um, the videos DVD the video is awful and I would not recommend spending any time watching it uh, and certainly at this point in time uh, Depeche Mode looks like um, they have uh, just taken the best clothes that they had out of their wardrobe at that time that they were going to wear out on a Saturday night and put them on and wore them for the video. And the other thing I should say is actually as an album, Speak and Spell is, is probably ideally designed to be listened to while crimping your hair before you go down to the local golf club in 1982. Uh, it's not designed to be listened to in 2021, 40 years later. Nobody was thinking that far ahead in the future at all. In no way, shape or form was anybody thinking that far ahead. Um, and I doubt people now are thinking, well, what's this music going to sound like in 2061? I have no clue. You know, that's 40 years away. Um, but I guess we'll find out when we get there. So if you're going to buy a version of the album, go, go the 5.1 mix on the DVD and the Super Audio CD. That's not all. There was the Greatest Hits album, of course, which I've mentioned before, the singles 81 to 85, uh, which has the singles on. Uh, but there's two extra releases, which I, I just want to quickly kind of mention. Uh, this is a 2006 remix uh, reissue of Just Can't Get Enough. Uh, remixed, I think, by the Dirty South. Uh, this wasn't. This mix has not been given a commercial release. Uh, it was put out as a promotional 12-inch, uh, backed with a remix of "Personal Jesus" by Timo Mars, and um, a design just really for club play. Uh, I have no idea why why that why it went in a remix, but this is the only remix of "Just Can't Get Enough" uh, that exists after 1981. It's not particularly good, mind you. And the remix promo I've got here has a press sheet uh, asking me to, to fill in um, a reaction on the website as to whether it's getting club play. Presumably for the 2006 Best Of album, they were debating releasing a series of remixes of Just Can't Get Enough. Uh, but I think this is the only one that came out. And the last thing I will mention um, is this CD here, uh, recorded at the Royal Albert Hall in 2010. Uh, this features um, a very rare performance of Photographic uh, by the band. They played it a handful of times in, I think, 2006 uh, and definitely in 2007. Um, and this was the, the show where they brought it back uh, without, you know, it was a complete surprise to everyone. In fact, when you listen to this CD, um, after this song, I think you can hear somebody in the crowd go, what was that? Um, so... That kind of proves just how rare that song was. I think it had been played very, very rarely indeed. Now, I'm going to quickly check, because I should have done this before. I'm going to quickly check uh, the uh, the wireless show uh, at the, the London Hyde Park. There, I'll find out if they played photographic there. I'm not sure if they did. And the answer is yes, they did. They played photographic at the wireless show. Uh, Hyde Park in 2006. Uh, and also at the Royal Albert Hall in 2010. Uh, but it's a very rare groove indeed. Uh, very rarely appears. Now that's me talking about Depeche Mode Speak and Spell. Um, I haven't meant to try to put you off it or anything like that at all. Um, if you're looking for a fantastic early Vince Clark album, this is it. Pop classics all the way through. It's just Depeche Mode are very good at what they do at this point already, uh, but what they do isn't always very good for me. I think probably there's about half a really, really good LP, in my opinion there. There's the three worst songs Depeche have ever released on here, uh, and there's a couple of okay tracks on there as well. What I would say is if you like Depeche Mode, um, 
it's well worth a listen if you haven't heard it but do track down the b-sides ice machine uh shout and the uh the single dreaming of me uh, because they're great songs and they should have been on the lp but they weren't i'm also going to post by the way as a wrap up uh links to some of the the radio recordings and tv broadcasts down there there's plenty of tv broadcasts and radio recordings from this era so you can hear live depeche um there's a show at uh, i think crocs in rally uh there's a tv broadcast of something else uh the last show with vince which is at chichester um uh, there's also i think um a radio broadcast from the uh london ica amsterdam paradiso which is an incredible venue and the paris las baines douche uh which i've no doubt pronounced incorrectly um, which are all available to stream and to listen to, and I'll put the links down there. So if you like early Depeche Mode, have a listen, and you go, oh my God, they sound so young, because when this album came out, you know, Dave Garn was, was 19, and whilst I've been critical of some of the songs on here, um, I guarantee you I couldn't have written a song as good as Just Can't Get Enough when I was 19. Um, I couldn't have written, I could have written a better lyric than, than pretty much anything that's on here at the age of 19, but I couldn't write a song as good as I sometimes wish I was dead or puppets or new life. Absolutely not. Uh, you know, it, it, Vince Clark came straight out of the gates writing classic, memorable, hooky songs in major keys um, right from the off. And I still stand by my view that you know, Speak and Spell is one of the best punk albums that has been released. It just happens to have been played on synthesizers. Um, and it has not aged um, particularly well. But then a great many things haven't aged particularly well, including James Bond films and some of my hair kills. Yes, I had hair. So I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, stay beautiful. Say nice things in the comments. If you've got nothing nice to say, don't say anything anyway. Uh, I've recently seen a couple of comments, I think, on The Cures Facebook page because it's 25 years since Wild Mood Swings came out. And people go, it's all been rubbish ever since Wish. And you go, well, just fuck off back to the past. I live in the now. Um, and whilst I've been critical of Speak and Spell, at the time it was probably an amazing LP. But at the time, I was eight years old when it came out. And the reason it came out in November and not earlier was because the pressing plans couldn't keep up with demand for the huge number of advance orders. Uh, the band's future seemed assured. The next time I talk about Depeche Mode, I'll be talking about their second difficult album, A Broken Frame. And in the meantime, stay beautiful, and I will see you all again soon. Thank you. And good night, or goodbye.